here and see such a full space, such a full room. Um, on a daily basis, I am doing my own research, and I always uh, check the number of attendees on the meetups regarding whether there is a machine learning in the topic or not. And I have discovered that if I display my topic on the meetup description, there is no people on the meetup group. That's why I needed to shorten my title. So on the meetup, you could see that I would like to talk about surveys, uh, in this, uh, about the segmentation in surveys. However, as a mathematician, I would like to cover the whole topic uh, in the title of my presentation. And I would like to present the idea of the non-negative matrix factorization. That's the method uh, that we are using in the segmentation. Segmentation is a process of grouping respondents or grouping observations in a certain market into smaller packets. So there, there, is, a, there is an idea that people that fill surveys, and we work in market research, so we often work with surveys. So people that fill surveys follow the same patterns when they, when they have the sort of opinion surveys to, to be filled. And this solution is um, kind of a savior in the situation when we work with a high dimensional aperture space. So have you ever maybe heard before about high dimensional feature spaces? Okay, that's kind of data science meetup, so probably you, 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 you did. Uh, and in your opinion, is 1000 features already a high dimensional feature space or not yet? Depends. It depends, it depends. Yeah, so actually it depends. So when I was a master's student, uh, I worked with bioinformatics data with the uh, DNA and we had biomarkers of every gene so there was 20k data in the data set so 20k it was big for me that time then I started working in the news portal and we had information about visits on certain websites and then it was 100k and for me that was big one and here in the surveys 100 features is extremely enormous feature space because it's a survey so there is a respondent that loses his patience and focus when he fills the survey. Also, there is a customer that um, asks us to perform the survey and then analyze results, and he would like to extract insights, only the crucial insights from the survey. So the key information would be to actually find certain questions that, uh, that drives the difference between people within the segmentation. So. Um, there is the idea that we would like to trim surveys as much as possible and also it cannot be as long as, as we would like it to be because the respondent loses their patients. Okay, so the use case that I'm going to tell you about, uh, we'll use the data of size 50 questions but can be still applied to any other data size. However, this is the case that we already found it problematic. We already said that, okay, for the traditional methods used in segmentation, 50 is already uh, a huge problem. And uh, who is this guy? So I'm an R passionate, I came from Warsaw today and I needed to walk up at 5 to be at the airport at 6 to get to the flight at 7, so it's already late night for me. Um, so I, I hope I'm still entertain an entertainment for you. Um, I organize R meetups in Warsaw and I'm a huge uh, Propagator of R. That's why we started YR uh, conferences that happen each year in Warsaw. The next one happens in two weeks, but I will come back to it uh, at the end. Uh, and on a daily basis, I work at Gradient Metrics, where we um, mix traditional market research approaches with the uh, new data science techniques. And it's a global company. There, we've got offices in four countries, but there are only four people in the company, which means there is one person in each country. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a um, Yeah, so as uh, the only representative of Polish office, yeah, uh, you might imagine that working alone is really hard, so I work in my basement, so this is the opportunity to see people, to talk to them, so probably this is more beneficial for me than for you. Um, yeah, so I'm really eager because if this, in this global setup you can actually meet people that are the best in this certain area. So I really uh, mm, would like to also promote this kind of setup of work, like you, you, you can work remotely in today's setup. 
and then you can meet the best people in, in, in the market with such an approach. All right, so let's get back to the segmentation and let's have uh, the definition and a few examples so we lay on the same page. So if you are wondering what's the difference between segmentation, clustering and grouping, that's quite the same, but there are some certain uh, business arenas where most of the people use segmentation, other use clustering, other use groups. So in the market research, we use segmentation so client does not get scared. So segmentation is the used term and also as, as a just a note, you probably would not say the classification model, but you would say the driver analysis model. So there are some different terms that they are more uh, familiar with. So the segmentation is the same as the clustering, if you, if you have this question in the mind. So that's the activity of dividing a broad customer of business market. So customer of business market might be the people using the application, people using uh, people going to, to the cinemas, business market can also be the group of people with the same interests like data science uh, enthusiasts or for example parents and we would like to divide this market into smaller groups as we know that there are different types of data scientists and also we know that there are different types of parents and the examples are for the segmentation where you can see the applications it's like uh, op opinion surveys in most cases when there are elections months before the elections there is the opinion survey on which uh, on which uh, party would you vote for or also mm, there is a brand loyalty segmentation like how people are loyal to certain com certain brands or aware of those brands uh, when I worked in the news portal we also segment people because they presented different behaviors when they were reading the content so different content was interesting to different kind of people and the whole idea is to extract the groups of people with similar patterns, interests or behaviors. Okay, so what questions it might answer? So if your mother asks you during the dinner, okay, why you keep doing the segmentation? Or the client would ask you, okay, what are the benefits if it comes to the segmentation? Or you are in a on a date and there are no more interesting topics, then you can always come up with the segmentation. Hey, okay, it's interesting, so, and why it's interesting? Uh, because you can determine how many groups are there in the market. That's always the key factor. How many groups are there? What are their sizes? Uh, what are the unique features? You've got a lot of features, specifically in the news portals. There are thousands of features. But what are those that are the drivers that actually um, can tell you to which specific subgroup the respondent or the client belongs to? And um, how you can assign future customers to the how you can assign future customers to certain groups and how this can improve your uh, marketing methods and what's cool from the segmentation in terms of uh, surveys is that you can have a survey with 50 questions then determine five drivers and use those five in the next survey so you use those five in the next survey those are the drivers that help you map new respondents to the results from the previous survey. So you've got the previous survey mindset, overview, the description of the group, and you also got new surveys. And there are meta surveys that, for example, tracks parents or teachers, there are multiple surveys being done, and then those drivers are taken out of the surveys and bigger, bigger picture is made based just on few questions. So the biggest goal is actually to extract the groups and also describe them with the least, uh, with the smallest number of questions as possible so they can be reused it's called in typing tools and what are the challenges it's not like that it's probably like segmentation is the most commonly known technique uh, in the in the basic statistics and in the market research but also there are challenges that we need to sometimes overcome and in most cases they relate to the type of the data you can work with the survey data probably you would need to uh, you would need to somehow adjust your methods or methodology when you work with different types of data. However, the challenges that we see at Gradient in our company is that it's an unsupervised learning method, which means there are no labels at the beginning. You don't know what is the number of groups, what are the, what are the groups and how they are described. And you often observe the mixture of data. There is the numerical data, what's the income for, what's the income of a respondent, categorical data, 
uh, what's his level of education and the multi-select or ordinal data. Sometimes the multi-select select question is with which brand are you familiar with? And then you select out of the huge list. So there's a mixture of different kind of, uh, different kind of data and that's a huge challenge. And there's also the huge dimension. So it's relative to the, it's relative to the application. Here, 50 questions is extremely long, extremely long survey. And uh, what is the challenge that clients put us on is actually the size of groups. So in the segmentation, you cannot have one huge segment and all the others that are small and unnoticeable. You would also have the description of each segment. So you can say, okay, segment A, I'm gonna talk about parents and teachers because that's the real use case we use later in the presentation. Uh, we were just um, reviewing their view on the education, how do people, how do teachers view the education and the responsibilities of parents and teachers and how also the other group parents view the responsibilities in, in the, within the education. So you would like to also have the description to actually name the group, okay, those are the uh, energetic teachers that like, like to train new methods and those are the um, teachers that already are close to their retirement and would like not to step out and do uh, some extraordinary 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 activities and then you need to pack it in, into the full story so if it comes to the ma mathematical applications and statistical modeling that's doable but the hardest part is to present the full story for the segmentation okay so the data structure that you observe if you are not familiar with that or if you are but let's just jump on the same page you observe the id of the respondent in the survey some demographic data like age race, gender, and there are some statements. So we ask a question, do you agree with the statement or do you agree? And the statement is um, children should be uh, graded at the same, at the same level or the, or the statement is uh, children should have grades adjusted just to their skills. So you can imagine that the old school teachers would say let's mark everybody at the same level and uh, and, 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 and the new teachers would rather say that, okay, the children should be marked uh, with the adjustment to their skills. He's the best, but he can also get new challenges and can be forced to, 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 to do better. And we asked N statements and people can agree or disagree. And then you can translate that to the Likert scale question, where, which means you order the agreement and disagreement on a scale. For example, from one to five. One is dis strongly disagree, five is strongly agree. And that's the data encoding we would use in this matrix decomposition. And it's not like that, you just collect any type of data. Uh, you go to panel provider that, uh, that has the group of people that, uh, that are there to, to fill surveys. And uh, if you are, if you are, I'm trying to find out the opinion of a specific market, let's say United States population, the general population, you would like to have the data with the same structure of demographic variables as it is in the general population. So we look after the distribution of the gender within our respondents, also the race and also the age. We see that we, of, we often have the Hispanic group that is underrepresented and also for this survey, like people within the age of 31 to 64 were also unrepresented. So then to map some results to the general population, if a group is unrepresented, we sometimes weight results of this group uh, so that they count like more than the other ones. Like those are treated times two, those are treated times one. Um, and for the Typical segmentation, one would use the k-means or hierarchical clustering, those are the methods that you, that you typically use. And thanks to those methods, you can create a distance matrix so that you see in rows people, in columns people, and in cells the distance between them. So this is the distance between respondent 1 and respondent 2, and it's some number that is small. And then you see the distance from the respondent 1 to respondent 3, and it's bigger. And based on the distance matrix, you can say, the guy uh, with the ID1 is closer to the 2 than to the 3. And based on that, you can actually use hierarchical clustering to determine the number of groups and the splits. 
So uh, what's the drawback of this approach? What's the biggest challenge? So this is the distance matrix that represents distances. So you need, you need a way to actually calculate the distance. And the definition of distance is that like it depends on which distance you use, on, on well, what's, what's the metric of your interest. And actually when there's a mixture of data and the size is getting bigger and bigger, most of the metrics loses their properties because of the size. Imagine Euclidean distance works properly in 3D, but loses it properly in 50D. And also some metrics are just designed to categorical data and others are designed to categorical one. So I've got a slide that represents many names of different distances. Uh, and as I would like to pin pinpoint, some of them work their features uh, for the great number, loses their properties for the great number of features, other work just for the specific cases. And what we would like to what we would like to have is to get a method that does not use a distance and also has a specific feature that it groups similar features within one group and also reduce the features that bring noise that do not drive the segmentation. Uh, so how to overcome those challenges? That's okay. That's huge feature space, we've got a mixture of data, not, not always, not in this use case, but that, that's sometimes the case. And also we would like to extract the most driving features. So the solution here, like we've tried many methods, um, some of them are better, some of them are worse, and it does not always work for every case. In the end, I've got the comparison of many methods. And uh, a method that we, not to say discover, but we like bring back to life, is the non-negative matrix factorization. And I would like to express the idea that stands under the hood of this decomposition. Uh, so I would like to adjust, adjust the mathematical stuff so it's, uh, so it's understandable for the broader audience. But if you have some more specific questions, then we can, of course, talk after, after the talk, or I can send you some paper with some more detailed information. So the idea is you start with, uh, you start with a matrix. And uh, the, the size is in rows, we've got respondents, and in columns, we've got the features. So we've got those statements. And the idea is to represent the original matrix by two other matrices. And that's just the composition, that's this factorization. Non negativity states for, uh, for the fact that the cells are non negative. Those are numbers from 1 to 5, from 1 to 7. Uh, and the moment it is non negative, also the split is non negative. So what those, what those matrices are, uh, they have the certain feature that the number of rows in this matrix is the same as here, and the number of columns is the same as here. And we also observe the hidden, the hidden dimension that is called rank, and it's, this, and it's here for the number of groups in the segmentation. And this matrix represents the respondents and their assignment to groups and this matrix represents features and their assignment to groups. That might not be as straightforward the moment you hear it for the first time. That's always the case with mathematics. So when I read a new paper, it takes me three times to understand the first page. So that's fine. So let's, 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 let's say it again. This matrix represents respondents. This represents features and cells are to compare the features and the respondents to the, to the groups, to the, hidden, to the hidden level called ranks. And how to interpret this decomposition? We see the respondent one is in the first row and we've got two numbers that can be uh, normalized to represent the probability and the higher the cell is, the, the, this, group, uh, this group is the group that the person is as assigned to. So if we observe this matrix and here are 0, 0, 0, and here is the 0, or those are small numbers, mm -hmm. and in the rest there are, group, there are huge numbers, we know that this respondent is assigned to segment 2, this respondent is assigned to segment 1. And we also can have more dimensions, more groups. Okay, and why we need this matrix and why this is really beneficial? Because we've got the same for the features. For the features, we've got the same. We've got cells, and the representation is that if a cell has a small value, then this feature does not point to this group. If, if it has a huge value, then it points to this group. 
So if it would be small and high, we would say the feature one is visible in group two, which means uh, it describes the group number two. And what we have at the same time, we've got respondent segmentation and we've got the knowledge which variables are visible in which segments. So within one decomposition, we've got two things, the segmentation and description at the same time. And with the traditional approach, what would happen, people would do the segmentation, okay, we've got segments, and now we would like to find drivers that differentiate groups, so let's apply classification method or let's just plot plots with breakdowns of, of this feature within, within the segments, and then let's find out what are the drivers for those segments. And here this is happening for, uh, for the features and for the groups at the same time. Let's see how it works in the practice. Um, so what's cool about the non-negative matrix factorization is the fact uh, we've got a matrix and we are looking for other two that when multiplied are really close to the original matrix. And we are looking for those that minimize the distance between the original and, and the decomposition. And what is cool, we can put the regularization, that's the extra, the, that's the extra term in, in the minimization function. And this regularization can influence the fact so that those matrices are sparse, which means has a lot of empty values. So if they are sparse, then that's good because the assignments are, are clear, are unique. So we are looking for matrices that are close to the original and also that are sparse. And we see you can either minimize one or the other, so it's always a trade-off. So we have a trade-off that it's not the exact same matrix anymore, but it has the feature of sparsity, so that you have clear rows assi assignments and clear assignment of feature, so that they represent a certain segment. And there are many, there are many methods that you can use to determine the distance between matrices. So, in general, the non-negative matrix factorization is the full family of algorithms, and depending on regularization and the distance you choose to minimize this function, it is like some kind of a method within the non-negative matrix factorization family. And that's the only R code I have in my, in my full presentation. And you can see that R is really pleasant, it's really cool. If you've seen Python, Jupyter notebooks and stuff, they're long, horribly long and terrible. And here R is beautiful, we see the, we see the, the precious part of R. That's just the function called NMF, it has X, the initial matrix. The rank, we determine the number of groups. I will say how to choose the best number of groups. We determine the number of groups, the method. So sometimes what to specify as those functions is the method and also the seed. And the seed is needed for the initial uh, specification of those matrices. So we start with some uh, points and then we try to update those matrices so they minimize this function. And uh, in most cases, the seed, is, uh, the seed is needed because the in initialization of those points is random, of those of values is random, and they are taken from the range of this matrix. So if we had Likert scaled features from one to five, so at the beginning, those, those will be numbers that are random, randomly selected from one to five. And you can handle the method for the function, you can specify the seeds, so the starting point is always the same. You can specify the rank, okay, let's see the speed for two. We can also see the speed for three, and then compare whether the speed for two was better than the speed for three. And we see one drawback that uh, when the seed is specified, we've got the random starting point. Okay, so for the random starting point, we might, we might end up with some something that is not, uh, in the end, really even close to the minimum. So what we typically do, so what we typically do, I will I will say on a, on another on another slide. Uh, okay, maybe maybe I'll, I will finish here. So we have this so we have this randomly selected matrices, and we re repeat that thirty times or fifty times. So we've got few few randomly selected matrices. Then we estimated the result, and then we can, we take the mean. And you can imagine that if we randomly select points for matrices and then randomly select points for another run, in the end, when we get the, let's say, for k equal to 2, we get those final matrices, 
the segment might be swapped. So that segment one actually is called segment two in the other group. But this can also be mapped when you look at the row sums and call sums. Okay, so let's get back to the real use case. I'm done with mathematics. So if that was too much, that's good because I'm here to actually, uh, you know, put some questions in your mind so that you are eager to dig in after the presentation. It's really hard to explain this stuff in 30 minutes, but I hope you at least get interested. Or you never come back to my presentation and then I'm, <laughs> and then I'm really sorry. Uh, so, the real use case is actually we had a client request to build, uh, to build a segmentation based on 50 mindset statements. Those are whether you agree, whether you do, do not agree. And it's always really, really short email. This should be a reasonable, reasonable number of groups. <laughs> okay? Go. Cool. Powerable sizes, meaningful description, built on a small on a small number of features as possible. So that sounds easy, and we are doing so many segmentation that we can come up with results within the next day. But what's happening here, it's not really easy. So I will tell you in on the next slides how we determine the, the rank and how we build the description for the segmentation. So let's get back again. So uh, for various case, so let's say we think that the k rank equal to 2, number of groups equal to 2, is a proper solution. But we also think that equal to 3 could be a good solution. Also, number of groups, number of groups equal to 4 could be a good solution. So we try the same method for various k's. Let's say from 3 to 9, because more than 9 is too much, 3 is still not enough for the client. The best client's perspective is always that there should be 4 or 5 segments. And we repeat for each k the same procedure n times because there is a random starting point. We repeat it n times, we take the mean, and we've got the solution for a k. And for different k's, we can compare the solutions based on, statistical, based on statistical measures of goodness of fit. And those are called dispersion, silhouette, and sparseness. And we will see their performance on the next slide. And there is also one, one, more, one more level that you can go. Imagine those 30 runs. Within those 30 runs, features are assigned to certain groups. And you can say whether certain features were always assigned to the same groups during those runs. And you've got a distance based on the co occurrence within random runs. And based on this distance, you can run another, another segmentation uh, procedure based on a hierarchical clustering. And this is called consensus clustering. And we will see a plot that presents how stable is the solution? Okay, so let's see some uh, use case about the goodness of fit. So on the x-axis I am presenting various cases, so that's from 3 to 10. We've got different um, metrics, that's dispersion, that states for the stability of the solution, reproducibility. The silhouette met met metric stands for how good is the observation uh, how properly the observation is fit to its segment in comparison to, 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 in comparison to the closest segment. So the, the bigger the better, that's the mean of the sil silhouette measures across all observations. And then there is a sparseness. And why there is so many, why there is so many lines? Because we've got two matrices. The one was for respondents and the other one was for columns. So the, the one for respondents is called basis and this is the red one. We also got the segmentation for features, and that's called coefficients matrix. We also have the um, segmentation built on the co occurrence of features within random runs, that's called consensus, and we've got best fit within every 30 runs for each k. And based on that, we can pick which k is the most suitable solution in this case. But there is a trade off the bigger sparseness, the better, but also the bigger silhouette, the better. And we would also like to have a huge dispersion. So based on those plots, as a statistician, what is your recommendation for the, for the best case? Six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> How many? Eight? Okay, so we've got all of those. I hear you. <laughs> so I would start with the silhouette. And I like to see, okay, there's a huge drop, so maybe four would be all right. But I see that it's not a really stable solution. So let's try maybe five. The stability is increased, the sparseness is increased, 
and still the silhouette is not that bad. But hey, really close, the sixth solution still has the same silhouette, better sparseness and better dispersion. So in the end, when we look at six, we recommend that six. But we, we, don't, we do not see the metric that is of the highest value to the client. And the, the metric that is the highest value of the client are the segment sizes. So imagine you selected six, and in the end there is one huge segment and five segments with one respondent. So that's not a solution at all in terms of business perspective. So actually what happened here when we proposed six, there was one almost empty segment that we removed and said that's a noisy segment, that those are hard teachers that cannot be assigned actually nowhere. And there were two segments that had really same description, so we grouped them into, into one segment. So in the end, the client was satisfied because he got four segments. So even well, excuse though... Excuse me, what was the size of the respondents? How many respondents did you have? It, it depends. In, in, in this survey it was 2,000. 2,000. Okay. In this survey, 2,000. Um, okay, so the consensus. So let, let's, let's have it again. We would like to have a matrix that is decomposed into two. Those two, for the estimation, the minimization process, need to have a starting point. So we selected random points. Because we selected random points for the initial start, let's repeat it because it might be not the best solution. We might omit the minimum because we selected such an extra uh, unfortunate solution, starting point that it brings us the worst solution. So we repeat it 30 times. And within those 30 runs, we've got, in the end, the solution that points whether two features were pre presenting the same segment, and that's the co-occurrence. If they were presenting the same segment, it means they occurred together, and if they don't, it means they didn't occur together. So, for example, we can then plot number of co-occurrences within the various features. So let's imagine here are those statement features, and the more reddish the better, which means those features really highly co-occur with each other within random runs. And for example, those features uh, at the bottom, with those here at the top, did not co-occur almost, almost never. So that's the, that's the magic of co-occurrence. And, and then there is the consensus, the consensus clustering assignments. We see, okay, that is the consensus group one, features that should represent the same information. Consensus number two, the other group, okay, that's not really stable. Actually, I think there is a third one, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. And we can then uh, see whether there is a stability between the co-occurrence, so here we see a huge, a huge uh, disadvantage of this solution because the features are assigned to the same group uh, those features are assigned to the same group, those are assigned to the same group but they often co-occur within, within each other so this is more uh, sophisticated plot and we rather would like to see as much reddish as possible and as much bluish as possible okay so based on those plots I would actually recommend k equal to 4 but I think those plots are for teachers and those were for parents, so you cannot compare this to, to the other metrics. Okay, and in the end there was a full uh, week of data calculations. We collected, so we actually started with the survey design that lasted a week. Then we collected data for two weeks. Then we were analyzing data for another one. And then a person was gathering the story. So after a month, we deliver such two tables. And that's really interesting where we present the methodology, the, the, the one that we use, the non-negative matrix factorization, and the other me methodologies that are typically used for the segmentation. You could hear about k-means, hierarchical clustering, partitioning around methods, and even something more. And we uh, provide the silhouette score. So you can see the higher the better, so those are solutions for 4, 5, 6. The silhouette is still, is still good in terms, of, in terms of silhouette score. The dispersion is not that bad, that is uh, for the stability of the solution. And when we see at the k equal to 4, the biggest segment is not that big. And when we look at the k equal to 6, the smallest is not that small. And then we compare it to the other solutions. And their best fit was actually for free segments. So the more segments, the silhouette was lower, and even though for the best number of segments the silhouette is 
kind of a 10 times smaller, it's 5, and here it's 50. So that's the comparison, how the non-negative matrix factorization beats the other, beats the other, beats the other methods. And as well, we also represent the story for the client, so that's the value that we actually deliver. This is the proof that the used method overbeats the other ones. It's stable and it has proper, proper uh, respondent assignment to groups. And then we've got a special question, with a special person with the domain-specific knowledge that prepares the summary. And within the summary we see that, okay, the segment 4 was of the size 15, that's acceptable. We've got the name, follow the guidebook teacher, those are the teachers that do not like changes. And we, based on the matrix that uh, presented the, the composition for features, we are able to extract over-indexed features and under-indexed features, and which means we are able to determine which questions are more, uh, which questions, with which questions people within this group are more favorable to, be, to, to agree with and less fa favorable to agree with. And we've got the percentage of how many people agree in this group, but that's not comparable because you need to compare it to the full population. So that's why you calculate the index. And index is number of people that, percentage of people that agree in this group in comparison to, to the people from the full survey. And it's normalized to 100, in this case it's 300, which means in this group, people there is three, three times more people that agree with the statement that report cards should compare students against against one each other. So they should be at, compared at the same level. Uh, and some notes. Let's get to the end. So most of the NMF versions, this is the full family, depending on the method you choose, have random starting point. The RAM selection is the crucial part. You've seen the process. We looked at the uh, statistical goodness of fit. We also looked at the at the consensus clustering and also needed to look at the sizes of, of uh, segments and what here is happening is the feature clustering so we've got the groups of features that are that point to uh, certain segments and this is not our implementation we have used uh, our package called NMF here is some some there is some more articles you can read about about that and uh, if you like the talk and you are eager to hear more about R and its applications, we are organizing in the next two weeks the YR conference in Warsaw. So if you would like to hear more similar presentations, I'm really happy to have a chance to promote this conversation uh, conference here. And yeah, thanks guys for staying and that's all for today. Okay, we've got two. Um, how do you select actually the distance metric and uh, the factor? Because I think that that's actually a crucial part to getting the minimum solution. The distance metrics for uh, matrices. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a hard one. That's a hard one because you go from the distances between observation to the distance between matrices, and that's more complex. So uh, we follow the wisdom of more experienced researchers and we try to use the default methods and so far they provided good results. However, however, I think there is a lot you can do. So in this case, for the default method, there is a, there is a trace within the matrix uh, multiplication divided by two. So like how, how how they are similar the moment you multiply them and, and see the see the, di the diagonal. And how do you make sure that you actually hit the global minimum of the decomposition of that and the uh, so for for the minimi for the minimization yeah. you can stop the minimization the moment you are really close. So when you are updating so for the, for the every est estimation where you look at the minimization, you can specify the number of iterations. Yeah. Okay. So after a certain number of iterations, you are somewhere. And also you can specify the um, epsilon that states okay, whether the value between subsequent iterations is getting bigger or not. And here we've got 30 runs, so there is a hope that most of them will get, will get to the minimum. 
and this is actually hard minimization because it's you're trying to be close and you also try to be far. So that's that's the minimum of the trade-off. Does it mean it's not complex? Or it was never promised to be complex? I have no knowledge whether it's complex or not, but if it's if it's if it reaches minimum I have the intuition that it should be complex. And the other part which makes it more a saddle point uh, Yeah. Okay. Okay, so he actually asked the three most difficult questions. Do you have another one? <laughs> no, no idea. this consensus uh, rather tries to prove how random it is or how stable it is. So the, the more blue and reddish points are, the more stable it is. Like the distinction between this group of features and this group of features is stable. They really often co-occur with each other but really often occur within the group for random runs. I suspect it's going to be fully random here as well. Do you think I will not see a big uh, hit uh, area somewhere? Okay, so it's also not the only metric that we use. We also got the statistical goodness of fit that for the random values and random noise would be meaningless. It would probably be as low as possible, at least for silhouettes. It should be zero then. So we look at statistical methods. We, use, we look at the stability of what are we talking about. And also we look at segment sizes and we look at the description. Um, so it's not like that. We just build the solution based on this, this heat map. So it's five places where we seek to ensure it makes more or less sense. And I'm not saying it's going to bring meaningful results every time. It's something like a DIC analog that would penalize for uh, making too many groups that would also protect us from having uh, non-meaningful groups that don't really rise to a reasonable size. Is there anything like, like that? Uh, and what was the first term? PCA? Um, DIC Bayesian Information Criteria. I would like to have oh. something that me for a good fit and uh -huh. So that you add BIC here. Something like that, but simple and analytic. Mm -hmm. And is the Bayesian in interface related to likelihood function where you estimate? Would need to compute the whole probability, and here I think it's. Yeah, mm -hmm. but why if you have seven possible groups, mm -hmm. right? seven possible solutions? So yes, if you have many more, then probably, but in this, I don't mm. uh, So I see, you, I see your comment. You would like to provide some other statement to this minimalization function? Yes. So it rewards you for, so it actually Mm. Yes, and such a metric would actually stop me at some point. It would tell me don't go any further because I start seeing a decrease in harm mm -hmm. in the feed, and I wouldn't even need to go and check other heat maps or, or, or whatsoever. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, so this BIC could be good, for example, when you actually do the real feature selection. So then you can say, okay, that's enough features. Yeah, because in the terms of BIC, we don't increase. And here we, in the end, stays with the same number of features, but they have the loadings that are reduced to zero for certain groups. So we are not reducing features, but we are reducing loadings of features within groups. What happens in reality is that you produce features that have like a diminishable probability mass, right? Okay. I mean, I see a column which uh, doesn't really dominate in any row. That's yeah, and means. then that means it's mm, useless for your application. Yes. You would like to have the one that has the that has the row which is actually the mass of the probabilities within this one row. And there is nothing systematic I can put like in a loss function or, or something like that that would prevent this to happen. Prevent actually what? What are we talking about? Um, the tendency to producing more groups. So actually what's what's here this? it's something you can actually influence features of those matrices. So that's that's anything you can put to influence certain features. So we use sparsity to have the sparse so that the distribution uh, actually points to one unique segment. And if it's all over the same with loadings within within segment, then it means features are useless. And that's the features that we are using, but there is anything you could use here. And I have I have no knowledge on other used functions in this moment. I think it's time for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question, perhaps. Okay, thanks. <laughs>